Okay. So uh, it led me to uh, try and find ways, of course, with my uh, mentors at a time from multiple hospitals, where we can actually overcome this, like um, training models specifically. And I would um, want you to think about neurosurgeons or every, every surgeon, specifically I'm a neurosurgeon, but every surgeon has some, um, I would say, traits or characteristics in that profession that resemble an athlete. Okay, athletes, if you even think about NBA players or football players or soccer players or wherever your, you know, your favorite sport is, uh, gym, gymnastics, they wake up in the morning and they don't just uh, you know, go to, to perform in a contest, they, they train. They wake up, they have some training. The training could be rigorous. It has nothing to do with the actual profession. For example, uh, you, know, you have to lift weights to have your arms strong, but for example, basketball is a totally different sport, just lifting weights. So there are all sorts of aspects. So your skill, basically, if you want to attain a certain skill, a certain, let's say, sport, you have to break the skill down to sub-skills. And then you have to find training models that actually mimic those skills, and you work on them. And once you, and th that's maybe, I think, is something uh, crucial, because once you understand the, 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 what is, for example, surgery is made out of, what smaller tasks are there, and you try and model them and mimic them, you first of all better understand surgery, and now you have a real goal. Now you can actually, okay, understand the subtasks that my bigger task is composed of. Let me take one of each and every one of those subtasks tasks and actually rehearse it many, many times. And that's very gratifying because once you do it, then you actually see that you're improving, and your teacher see that you're improving, and you're starting to do things much more easily and things you know, are more flowing. Uh, so the main challenge for me was to try and um, basically understand what are those sub or mini tasks that we are actually trying to achieve in, in, in neurosurgery as far as neurosurgical skills. And this led me to a concept that I termed a grocery store lab, as you may, may uh, see here. Basically, we call it basic microsurgical training models, uh, and it's specifically um, skills that are re relevant to neurosurgery. However, other doctors may, may you know, kind of see parallel uh, lines to their own profession. So first of all, the need, I told you the need is very clear. Microsurgical skills are harder to teach and practice. Why are they hard to teach? Because the margin of error is small. You know, if you're working uh, close to the cortex or the brain, there's some millimeters that you are coagulating, which are not a tumor, but actual brain could cause a deficit to the patient. Once a resident does that, there's no going back, right? So that's one problem. Margin is very small. Second of all, it's not a continuation of previously learned skill. For example, you learn how to saw or to cut on a wound when you're an intern. And then in surgery, there's some stuff that are resemble that. Also in nurse surgery, once you open the skull, you make an incision. Those are all macro surgical skills. I mean, there are large procedures, you make relatively large movements. It's not so delicate, but here you're stepping into a different world. You're working with a microscope or loops. Things are much more delicate and hand movements have to be more precise. So, but it, and it's not resembling stuff that you did before. So it's like a gap that you have to uh, bridge. And then importantly, as we said, okay, so it's hard to, to manage those things. So let's, let's train, let's, let's use models. Okay, but the models that we use in neurosurgery are very expensive and the preparation is time consuming. So uh, what I can show you, for example, cadaver labs, okay, that are very important. Sometimes we use animal dissections or dead animal dissections to better have the, feeling or sensation of a living tissue. Sometimes you use part of cadavers in all sorts of techniques like perfuse, perfusing organs from, from people that are already dead in order to, to work in them. Uh, and all these stuff you see here are very important, but they're very rare to come by. I can guarantee you that even in the best of institutions, maybe once or twice a year, residents have the chance to actually uh, practice those skills. So in residency, there's no way those models that are used and are very good, like published, that's what you're going to see in the in, in papers usually, it's, it's not something that's uh, very um, doable in residency. And why? Because first of all, it's expensive. It's not belong in every hospital. You have to drive and residents are tired. Once you're off duty, yeah, you're sleeping sometimes at home, sometimes in the lounge of the residence once your duty is over. Uh, and basically you're tired. You're constantly tired when residents, you want to eat, you want to sleep. Sometimes when you see your friends or family, if you have the time and you need to study for the next case that you have. So no, most residents would not now try and go and drive like an hour away 
set up a model and work on it. That's just going to happen. Yeah, it could happen twice a year, three times a year when there's like protected time. And that's good. It's just important. It builds a concept of what you have to do. However, that's not what athlete does. Like athletes, basketball players, football, and so forth, they go out and practice every day or every week or every, a few times a day on small skills. And that's what we need to do, but it's hard. So in order to bridge a gap, which is obvious, we thought about creating models that are simple. Okay, and I was alluding that in the in the um, in the headline. So the maintenance has to be simple. You have to be refrig if it had to be refrigerated in minus seventy degrees of nitro oxygen. No, that's not a good model because where I'm going to find, uh, uh, you know, for example, a very um, strong refrigerator that can cool. No, so it has to be easily maintained. It has to be very close by. You, can, you have to go to a supermarket or 7-Eleven and get it, right? Otherwise, you're not going to travel like two hours to get a specific tissue from a specific butchery or something like that. Okay, and it should be very easy to set up. Okay, once, for example, you can keep it in a simple refrigerator, you can buy it in a supermarket. If it's going to take me two hours to prepare that model, no, I'm not going to now finish my duty. I'm going to sit two hours to prepare the model. And then I'm going to, no, it has to be easy. It has to be very, very easy once you buy it. You keep it, you just open it. It's like a ready, ready made lunch. Okay, so we have to be easy. Otherwise, it's not going to work. Now, importantly, uh, to get like the whole concept going, you have to define a few microsurgical skills, okay, which most neurosurgeons would agree they're essential to start microsurgery. I'm talking about micro neurosurgical skills, one you use under a microscope. You have to establish models that are readily available. It's very important and cheap, right? I'm not going to spend like a hundred bucks on a model that I could need, need to train on a couple times a month. Um, again, we have to assemble a minimal surgical toolbox. Of course, we, we need to have a microscope. Now, every department in the world that does nursery has a microscope. And sometimes this microscope is not being used. Uh, most occasions, there's a, there are like four or five microscopes. One of them is, is uh, used for training or sometimes not being used. So, so there's always one available microscope. Don't, don't worry about that. It's not something you can do at home, but it's available. And some basic tools, which are usually uh, you can get from, from the OR nurses, like, uh, you know, a set of pickups that's out of order and so forth. So it's very big. Uh, th those like minimal requirements are there in most departments. And then the, so we define the cost. It has to be cheap. Every model has to be like under five dollars. Uh, maintenance has to be very easy, like a fridge it should be available in the nearest supermarket. Now, there's something called haptics. Haptics is the resemblance of um the tactile motion, the, I mean, the tactile feel of, of tissues. So whatever you're handling, okay, whatever piece of training model that you're using, it has to resemble the native tissue that we're working with. Somehow it has to, uh, the resistance of the tissue, it has to mimic something that's very similar to the tissue. Otherwise it's not going to work. That's maybe the most novel part about this, th those models. And the workflow has to be similar. Once we define a task, the, the, workflow to achieve that task has to be the same as in the OR. You're going to see that soon. And preparation has to be simple, under five minutes. Okay, and then we define a few basic microsurgical skills. In neurosurgery, for example, a very basic skill is drilling. We use drills because, as you understand, we all have skulls. We have to get past the skull to get to critical brain structures. Now, it's not like an IKEA that you just screw it into the wall. You have to work very delicately with a drill. We have special drills. You're going to see them soon. And you basically shave off bone. You have to shave it very, very, very gently because after that last piece of bone, you get to the brain. So you want to be able very carefully to shave it piece by piece, piece by piece to get to where you need to get. And you also do it under huge magnification. So every hand movement you do has to be very, very uh, precise. Now it's hard when the drill is rotating. Okay, so that's, that's one skill, drilling. Other skill set is dissection. We basically separate important brain structures from tumors, from aneurysms. So we have to basically um, try and detach membranes that are there in the brain, cutting the membranes without hurting structures within the membranes. We mustn't hurt blood vessels and so forth. Specifically, the membrane that we're working on is called arachnoid. Arachnoid is a very delicate membrane that's kind of uh, wrapping many uh, brain structures, such as arteries, a pituitary gland, other brain parts. So we have to dissect that membrane many times. Uh, and also, for example, tumors. If you want to dissect the tumor, you want to mostly make sure you're taking out the tumor and the brain itself is left unharmed. So you have to dissect in between, finding that fine plane that's separating them. And then lastly, or not lastly, but I mean a, a big um, important skill is placing sutures. Okay, so sutures 
could be, you know, just simple wound surgery, but under the microscope, it's different because you're not using your hands immediately, you're using long tools. Sometimes you have to suture through very uh, long, narrow corridors. So you're not suturing superficially, you're suturing somewhere deep. So the movements are di different, okay? Uh, so for example, the first skill, okay, um, is to drill under the microscope. That's what's simulating. And this is an egg, okay, that I'm gonna show you. But here, that's that's what happens, the OR, okay? There's, this is a, a patient's head. It's screwed in something we call a Mayfield, which is a head holder. Because once you operate on the brain, we, we must make sure everything stays stable. So this head holder holds the skull very tightly, okay? So the skull doesn't move. And this is the incision, but what you really do after you cut open incisions, you can see in the movie, okay, I'll just pause it here. This is basically the drill. This is the drill bit. Of course, everything here is magnified. And this is the bone. This is the skull that was partly removed. Underneath here, there's like a very large vein. And you want to take off bit by bit the skull, but without hurting this large vein. This is an essential part of what we're doing, okay? And as you can see here, I can stop it here. You see this blue discoloration? Is it, uh, Ashley, is it noticeable? Okay, so this this is basically this large, it's a sinus. It's called a sinus. It's sitting somewhere here at the back of our head. And we, we mustn't let it bleed because it has large proportion of the venous blood of our brain uh, flowing into it. So you we really want to take off, shave the bone. As you can see, you want to shave the bone, but we mustn't, one second, we'll just, okay. So we want to shave the bone, but we don't want to hurt um, the vein itself. So here, there, this is an egg, a hard boiled egg. And as you can see here, I got the same two pieces. I got the drill and I got a small roton uh, dissector. And what I'm doing here is basically I'm thinning out the shell of the egg, as you can see here. I um, kind of uh, just, you know, colored with some marking pen, um, some lines that resemble the, the vein itself. And now I have to take out the shell. But as you can see here, there's a further part, which is the white part of the egg. And I don't want to hurt that. And again, this is not real neurosurgery, as you can see here. And this is the egg. You can see the egg is placed uh, at the base of a cup. And what I'm going to do now, I'm going, I'm going to drill all the, you know, this red, like, painting. But I mustn't hurt the, the egg, which is underneath. Okay, so very delicate movements, very small movements, taking out the shell without hurting the egg itself. Okay, so this is like uh, one... Okay, one example. Here again, this is like for the more advanced of you that ma managed to get this right, um, an uncooked egg. Okay, so the price here to pay is much harder because, uh, you know, you're going to spill that, you're going to have to clean the eggs, you're going to be much more, okay, sophisticated. And you now again, you shell the, the, um, the you tin the shell, you take it off, but you make sure you're not hurting the egg and that has to be your final result. Okay, you have to take off the shell, but just the shell. So trust me, if you're going to do this well, you're going to do well in neurosurgery once you have to drill. Okay, so this is very simple. You take an egg, place it on a cup. So this is for drilling. Another um, important, maybe one of the most important skills that we have is a dissection. We have to be able to dissect under a microscope and separate pathological tumors, pathological tissues from, from native brain tissue without hurting the brain. So what we thought would be the most suitable for this is an orange. I'm coming from Israel. We have many oranges, very cheap. I know the state's a bit more expensive. I bought here an orange last week. It cost me 75 cents. But in Israel, it's, it's cheaper. Still, I think it's worthwhile. And, th and this time, I'm going to just, you know, have you imagine just before I'm going to start the movie, one of the wedges of the orange is a tumor. Let's say, can you see my cursor on the screen? Okay. Yes. This wedge, for example, is a tumor. Now, that's how it looks really when you open the brain. There's a tumor and the other wedges from here and here, that's normal brain. So you just want to remove this wedge, okay? You don't want to hurt this wedge. You don't want to hurt that wedge. Okay, so if you ever try to open an orange, you know that once you peel one wedge, you always hurt the other ed wedges. So let's try, try now with micro instruments, remove the middle wedge, which is, which is the tumor. We can cut it. We can debulk it. We can incise it, whatever we want, but you mustn't hurt the other wedges, okay? And I'm going to show you back and forth going, this is through a microscope, I'm going to show you back and forth an orange with a wedge representing a tumor and a real OR case, okay? So as you can see here, all those membranes of the orange, they're very similar in a way to the membranes that we have 
in our brain that are basically uh, separating, as you can see here, a tumor on the, uh, as you can see here, held by the pickups and normal brain. So here again, we want to use patties because now we start to delineate the tumor. You see, I'm, I'm cutting it, I'm, I'm reducing its volume, but I mustn't hurt the normal brain, which is, as you see here, I have to protect it. So we have to cut the membranes, we have to separate it, we have to use patties, and in the meantime, we're gonna debulk the tumor to make it smaller. Once we make the tumor smaller, we can mobilize it. Again, you can see a real OR case, okay, where we mobilize the tumor and we separate it from normal brain and we put in patties to try and create a plane. Okay, and this is the real workflow in the OR, as you can see here. Again, very similar to what we do with a simple orange. Okay, and everything is done with a microscope and with the same tools that we use in surgery. Okay, so I'm just gonna let you watch it and um, appreciate the similarities. Now, importantly, uh, what we measure here, it's very important to have metrics. Like if you can't give a score to a certain drill, that's that drill won't last. So um, here the, the, we obviously measured how much time does it take to complete the, see here, we, we're taking off the entire tumor soon. So we, we measured the amount of time it takes to take off the tumor. That was one um, important thing. And the other thing is we counted number of side tears. What are our side tears? You see the normal brain on the side, we want to, 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 to measure how many tears are there. So here again, you remove the tumor at the end, you see the brain is protected, okay? And at the end, you remove the tumor, the brain is protected, that bleeding is gonna be stopped. And this is the equivalent of removing the tumor while making sure the edges are unruptured. And as you can see here, um, the, the brain or the size of brain are normal and wherever the wedge was is gone. And we, we counted how many side tears do we cause while we do it? Obviously, when we start to cause many citers, and when you once after five or ten tries, uh, the number decreases. Just shows that you're doing it better. And trust me, again, it hel helps. Um, once you're a second or third year resident, you do it quite often, and then in surgery, it does help you. So this was the orange model. Another model that we've um, used. This is like another uh, the grapefruit actually, and. It's a, it's a different kind of dissection. Uh, one of the most important parts in the brain to split is a, a structure called the sylvian fissure. It separates the frontal lobe and the temporal lobe. Many of the brain vessels lie there, and it's kind of a highway to the base of the brain. If you can drive this highway and you can split that fissure in, in neurosurgery, you can get into all the important stuff that you need at the base of the brain. So here again, the, 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 the important thing is to open this fissure is it, without, again, hurting. We don't have to remove anything here, just to open it. This is a real OR case. See all the vessels here? This is the cilium fissure. We actually dissect membranes from a real OR case, as you can see here. Just the membranes without hurting the brain. And again, here we peel very gently. We go deeper and deeper. Okay, and again, it's very important to do so with minimal uh, damage to the... Um, to the parts of the fruit, which we don't have hurt again. Same, same tool, same techniques, same movements. Okay, you can, you have to tilt it. You have to get some sort of a feel for the micro scissors. These are micro scissors for the dissector, as you can see above. And then um, again, step by step, you open, you go deep, you go deep, you separate. And this is what I mean by haptics or by workflow, similar workflow and similar uh, feel for the tissue. Okay. Uh, another, um, let's say, important skill. Okay. And this was published before, but this is the, the, the recent ones were not, but this is, I mean, the recent, the, the um, last movies that I've shown you is something we've, we came up with. This was something that was already shown in the past. This is a chicken wing. Okay that you can buy also in a grocery store. And the chicken wing has the brachial artery of a chicken. Now, interestingly, the diameter of that artery is similar to the diameter of arteries in our brain. So one of the procedures we do in our surgery is micro suturing. We take a blood vessel from the neck and we connect it to a different blood vessels in the brain that's clogged. It's kind of, it's called a bypass procedure. Actually, Dr. Langer is an expert in those and I'm here studying it uh, from him. Uh, so one way that, you know, I prefer for my fellowship is taking a chicken, dissecting it with a microscope and connecting 
two arteries in the chicken wing um, that are have similar diameters. So we use similar tools. And you can see here, we use very, very tiny sutures. So first of all, you have to dissect. You can see the, the artery itself from, uh, it has some sort of membrane, you have to split it. Obviously it's not pulsating, this is a real aura case, okay, where we separate membranes from arteries on the brain. Okay, this is again the chicken. We clog the artery. Obviously here the chicken is dead. Okay, so artery is not pulsating. It was just done for purposes of showing resemblance. This is in the brain itself. And then as you can see here, we will, uh, I'm gonna track it back a bit. We're decannulating the artery. This is in real OR case, making sure that this artery could be sutured. Sorry, again, I'm gonna. So what, what's gonna happen next is this artery, this is a real OR case, will be sutured to that artery. So there will be a bypass. Blood will come from this artery, which is patent, to this artery, which was clogged um, downstream. So blood, new blood supply would come through this artery to this artery. So they have to be sutured together, okay? So this is a very delicate anastomosis. As you can see, you have to protect the vessels. You have to wash them so there won't be any thrombus in them and any clogging. Uh, and then you use very delicate sutures, as you can see here. Sorry. So these sutures, I, just to give you an example, the you can't really see those sutures unless you're looking at under a microscope. They're called 10 O sutures and they're uh, the size of a hair, maybe. Okay. Uh, one of my hairs that you can see. <laughs> uh, and so, um, this is a similar process that we like I did in chicken. Okay, so you have to again work with the same uh, instruments, the same sizes, getting the same feel. Uh, another case for suturing, easier suturing, uh, is done for um, in, in back surgery. Sometimes we open the layer that where the spinal cord is, is covered by a layer called dura. So the dura has to be open and has to be closed at the end of cases. Specifically, it's done for tumors of the spine where you have to open. This, this layer. And we have to stitch it really well because there's some fluid in it which mustn't uh, leak, called the CSF. So again, this is a real OR case where we suture, this is the back of the patient. Okay, the patient is lying on its belly. This is the back. And this is a real OR case where we suture the dura, okay? And as you can see, we do it in a, some, some it's very, it's quite steep. I mean, you don't do it on a surface, it's down at the back. And here again, we just take the chicken of that, the, the, sorry, the skin of the chicken that we just, uh, you know, used for the other attempt. And you have to suture it and you just do it repeatedly using micro instruments. These are larger sutures, of course, but it's the same concept, same movements. Uh, and you go over it again and again and again, everything is done under a microscope. Obviously it's uh, been enlarged until you get a watertight closure of the chicken. Okay, so again, similar, simple and very cheap. So again, model parameters, they have to be cheap. And we have to have metrics. That's very important. I'm going to show you now. Uh, so, for example, chicken or orange or eggs, those are all stuff that are very, very uh, available. And I'm just going to show you now um, something that's a bit more advanced, but the same, same concept again. So the orange model, I'm, I'm going to show you here something that was kind of spun off that. Call it the egg model. So, sorry. Do you see that well? Okay, so yes. one of the tools that we use in, in nurse surgery, specifically a tool that's a bit more expensive and then therefore it's not, you can't get it at home, but you can get it every department. It's called a Cavitron. Cavitron is this tool that we use in nurse surgery that has a rotating tip. Uh, it's rotating with an um, ultrasonic aspirator. And basically what it does, it kind of moves within the tumor, shakes it, breaks it and sucks it. And it can basically work within the tumor uh, once there's a different tissue around it, like brain, it kind of stops. So it kind of senses the difference within, of, in between tissues. However, it's a very delicate tool and you use it to remove tumors primarily. It has uh, a few setups. So this tool, again, many residents start to use it. They don't know exactly how to use it, how to calibrate it, what is the feel. So we said, let's build a model that could help residents like train, get some um, help. And the thing that was most suitable was an egg. I'm gonna show you a different part of the egg. We used the shell last time. This one is the, the yolk, okay? So again, the same concept, but basic microsurgical skills, and also the same beginning. 
again, they're hard. It's hard to, to attain those skills. So um, what makes a model a, a good model? I'm going to just skip on those slides. OK. So what is required for a good model? So again, we said it has to look similar, similar geometry. OK. For example, the orange that you saw before, this is an MRI image with a brain tumor. So you can see the tumor and the brain around it. And here, there's a kind of a tumor with brain around it, as you can see in this orange. OK. So it's important, the similar geometry, somehow, yes, you have to use your imagination, of course. Then similar haptics, we, I told you before, it's like the feel. It's not just that the model has to look similar, it has to feel similar. And then again, with the orange, it does feel similar. Similarity of, of in workflow, which is basically the tactics of how you do it. Use the pickups, then you use the micro scissors, then you use the pedis, then again the pickups. Those, you know, uh, flow of movements that your hands are getting acquainted to, it's very important. And importantly, you have to prove it works, not just to publish it, but to actually show and convince people that what they're doing is not a waste of time. So you need to have good metrics. If you can't quantify or quantitate a score for a given task, and then you say, okay, your score was, let's say this, and then you improved to, you had an X, now you're doing X plus Y, now you're doing X plus Y plus Z, and there's a gradual improvement. If it's in time, if it's in score, then, people are not going to buy it or not going to really see that it's working. So you have to have some good metrics that are showing it works. So with the orange model, we published it in, in, in World Neurosurgery. It was interesting. They, they kind of um, were not sure when I sent the paper that they might, I might get some sort of a rejection with some sort of a, a laugh from the editor. No, they loved it actually, and they published it. And it's called the orange model, just like we, we did. And we expanded on this. This was for arachnoid dissection, as you saw before. And now we expanded it with an egg. So the egg, actually, if you can see here, this is the brain. And many times there's a tumor that lies deep in the brain. It's called deep-seated tumor. Now, often those tumors, uh, they're, they're not evident once we open the skull. We have to cut a part of normal brain to get to them. So we make sure that, first of all, we identify uh, that the cortex, that the outer layer of the brain, where, which we want to cut, is is silent. It's not part. It's it's interesting, but not all the parts in our cortex are important. So we have to identify parts that are not so important. We can cut through them, a small cut, and then we are working deep to remove those tumors. So as you can see here, that's an example of a tumor that's lying deep. We're working with a set of instruments through a hole, and it's very similar as you can imagine to the white part of, or sorry, the yolk. Where the yolk is the yellow part of the egg sitting. Um, surrounded by the white part of the egg. Okay, so the key principles of those kind of, you know, um, tumors is you have, you wanna take out as minimal normal brain as possible. It's called minimal cortical disruption, just for exposure. Uh, you need to remove the tumor, of course, as much as you can, but you don't wanna hurt the surrounding brain. So you actually want all the, all the yellow stuff gone without hurting the white stuff. And importantly, the CUSA, CUSA is that, uh, device that I've told you about, that rotating tip that we use to remove tumors, you have to use it efficiently. Some people don't use it efficiently, and you can disrupt brain with it, and there's you, there are some configurations of it that you have to kind of play with, so that was another goal. And I'm going to just show you here, so that was the egg. We took an egg, and we marked borders around it, and we asked the trainees that actually participated in the model to work within that um, line that we've, uh, the circle that we've drawn. We've drawn one centimeter um, radius circle. Okay, so that was one request. That request, remove as minimal brain as you can. Don't, don't disrupt the entire corridor. And at the end, we want to remove as much tumor as you can. For example, here, the, the trainee that did this case, uh, he didn't expose well the yellow part, and there's so much yolk that's remained. So obviously, the score is not going to be complete. And in this case, a different case, someone was very enthusiastic. He took the entire tumor out, but he took so much more brain. As you can see here, the whole white part, which is representing normal brain, is kind of eaten up. So this was too enthusiastic. Also, not a great score. And so we developed a basic score that kind of takes everything into account, the entry point. Okay, You have to adhere to that entry point. You mustn't cut wherever you want. Then you have to expose correctly. And then you have to take out as much as you can without hurting around. And we gave specific scores for every element. 
And then we took that egg, hard boiled egg, as you can see, it's very cheap. It's very simple. You get a hard boiled egg, you put it on a cup, on a paper cup, you go to the OR. And from there on, you have a microscope, you have the CUSA, which is the handheld probe that this resident is holding. You can start your dissection. Okay, 4, 5 p.m. afternoon, you finish your duties, you take a, a boiled egg from, from one of the fridges, you go down the OR, you book the OR for an hour, and that's it. You turn on the microscope, you can start working. Okay, very simple. This is a short movie demonstrating the concept. Again, you can take out... Okay, I'm just going to turn off the, the voice, the volume. So again, you use that probe to dissect. This is normal brain, which we do. We expose normal brain. And here, the, the, the um, yellow part is basically the tumor. Again, you can see here that's a real OR case where there's normal brain around and we use that handheld probe just to remove the tumor. So again, same thing here. We're removing stuff and then we have to remove as much as we can from the yellow without hurting the white, okay? There's a balance. You want to remove much tumors you can without hurting the brain. And again, you do it, you have to kind of explore, you have to move the microscope, you have to play with the CUSA. That's part of a, really what happens in the OR. You want to be able to see as much as you can, to move around, to maneuver. And I guess you can understand why um, as neurosurgeons, we, we sometimes do not allow the residents to do more. <laughs> or you have to be very, you know, it's a matter of trust. You have to trust someone. And that's the end of the case. You cut the egg into two and you can assess how much yellow is rema has remained, how was the exposure, how much of the white was disrupted, and you can get a score. What we did show, and this is the metrics part, as, as we, we tried four trials for every um, trainee. So we had a PGY1, which is a first year resident. We had two second year residents, a, a fourth year resident, a seventh year resident, and a senior. Okay, and as you, you can see on the first trial, they all had graded scoring. The, the person that had no experience had the lowest score, and the senior had a quite high score. So that's important. But then with repeated trials, everyone improved. The one that had no experience improved quite substantially, and the senior improved even more. So everyone improved, each person improved according to his own personal experience. But then that basically shows that this model is valid. And this is the time it took to complete the task. You can see everyone, there's a downtrend. So everyone improved with the time. At first it took them something like 20 something minutes, and by the end, uh, it was more of like the, the senior, the more, the more senior operator, it took him under 10 minutes and the ones that are less, something like 15 minutes, but everyone improved. So it just shows you that practice, I, I don't know if it makes perfect, but it definitely improves uh, whatever skill you're trying to attain. And this is a bit more complex. I'm not gonna go into that, but it just shows that uh, the CUSA, that technological uh, instrument that we're using to um, cavitate the tumor and suck it, there was, uh, more understanding of how you use it with repeated trials. That's actually the device itself. And these are the residents that uh, have used it. So again, just sitting um, at your convenience afternoon at the OR, um, you know, being able to, to, to practice. Now I'm gonna go back to my story. Uh, again, sometimes um, when I was serving um, in the military as a doctor, one of my primary goals was to prepare the medics uh, to um, to combat, where they have to function when situation is stressful, they have to work fast, they have to put IV lines, maybe um, do some resuscitation and so forth. And thank God we don't have so many cases where this is the case, but you have to train them still. So you have to use, to use modeling for that. So uh, we use dummies, okay, so sometimes, or we have to use equipment or tubes that are looking like uh, ribs or uh, thorax to put drains or other stuff. So we had to use whatever we had within the unit. Uh, and the, move, the unit is kind of traveling a lot. So there's not always gear that you can practice with, but we have to kind of improvise, all time improvise, improvise, improvise and find ways to get better. And I think the same line of thought is like, you know, the, the door is closed, you have to go through the window. The window is closed, you have to go through the chimney. You have to always find a way, always also to improvise and think about ways to get better. And sometimes things are really not that simple in terms of it doesn't look like, you know, there is a way, but there is a way if you think out of the box, uh, you manage and you have to just um, keep pushing. So um, that's, I think, is maybe transferable to every profession that you're in. If you want to get better at something, especially if it's a skill, you have to try and identify, break the skill into sub skills and then master them. And sometimes it's very hard to find a model. 
True. You won't get your opportunity at the OR sometimes. Um, if you're going to get it and you're not going to do it well, the next opportunity is going to come in a long time because no one's going to trust you. So you have to find a way that once the duty is over, you have the time with yourself to train, just like an athlete. Again, you train again and again and again. You get the skill. You get the confidence. Next time you're the OR and you're asked to do something, you do it with confidence. You do it right. They're trusting you. They're letting you do more. So that's the thought process of every, I think, surgeon, especially in training. That's the hard part. It's a very frustrating part. Many times after a year or two, surgical residents, I don't know if they retire, but they have this kind of deep in their uh, emotions. They feel um, maybe um, down. That, that's, that happens to, to most uh, surgeons, especially in microsurgical, um, let's say, oriented uh, residency programs. Uh, but then again, the, so the door closes, you have to find a window to get in. There, there has to be another way. It has to be able to practice, to, to, to keep it up, uh, lift your chin, lift your head up. You're going to find a model. You're going to work on it. You're going to get better. And then you could progress. That's like a computer game that has stages. Uh, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Okay. And I uh, hope you uh, enjoyed it. I have I cannot take any questions, I guess, in the next 10, 10 minutes or so, if there are any. Thank you so much, Omer. Everyone was loving that. Um, so cool. I think the orange was my favorite um, for the tumor removal. I know Dr. Langer wants to hop onto this call. Um, so I just promoted him to a panelist too. Um, but yeah, loved it. That was so great. Um, there was something I wanted to ask you about, um, but, oh, someone asked about, so if you don't have access. That was awesome. I'm sorry I got here late. You know, Omer is a, uh, we're very lucky to have Atlantic Silvis here. And um, I think he's one of the more creative people that I've seen his stage. He's an engineer and uh, he brought his whole family from, uh, Israel to spend a year with us and he's on his way up to Boston to Mass General after Lennox but um, you know Omer's the kind of he, it, Omer's an example I mean all you guys ask about you know your pathways and all this stuff but he's an example of it's no rush you know it takes time to learn this stuff it takes time uh, along the way to get trained and there's no rush. And, and he, you know, finished his residency already. And now he's going to do a year with us, going to do a couple of years in Boston. I think that he's really representative of the kind of mindset and the, the kind of intensity it takes to do this well. And he's come up with all these ideas himself about uh, different ways of learning microsurgery. And he's already made an impact at Lenox Hill. And he's only been, been here two weeks. So uh, just take his, uh, his leadership and his, his kind of way of managing things is an example of, of the right way to do it the right way. And I don't think you can fail if you do that. So Omer, thank you for your uh, great talk. Thank you for the kind words. I have and to be working your, this year. So it's not, you finally, uh, have, you finally have your social security number soon. Hopefully <laughs> tomorrow. Yeah. And then you can, then you can pay taxes. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> Never thought of this one. Yeah. That's funny. <laughs> um, so cool. So some people were asking um, if you don't have access to these kinds of tools. I know you were specifically speaking more for residents, but we have a lot of people at home who are eager um, and want to learn how to do surgery. Is there anything they can do at home? Like, with I think it's much more transferable if you talk about any kind of surgery, because basically I think there's ample models for um, as I, as I kind of divided roughly between macrosurgical and microsurgical skills. So for microsurgical skills, it's a bit more complex. You got to have a microscope or a cus or cavidron or, you know, or micro tools. Okay. You don't have to go there, but for basic macrosurgical thing skills, I think uh, on YouTube or, you know, wherever you turn to, there's like a set of drills and videos and definitely it's doable. Again, you can use um, anything that has skin, any living tissues or pest living tissue. Um, you could get some basic suture from every clinic and yes, definitely like suturing, um, basic stuff that has to do with, um, cutting the right way, holding the, the, the needle the right way. Yeah. All can be practiced and much more easily if, if you were talking about just a general, um, surgical skill. Cool. Got it. And sometimes, the sometimes, the yeah. I mean, sometimes the best, uh, is to go, you know, 
find an animal lab to work in, um, especially when you're in college. It's a little harder in high school, but um, when you get to college, if you really want to know you want to be a surgeon, um, you know, you, you, any kind of animal lab, you often will have some technique. It, it doesn't necessarily have direct application to, uh, to human surgery, but for example, when I was in college, we were, uh, we were doing what are called patch clamping. It was, an, it was in a physiology lab, and we were basically taking pituitary glands from rats and mounting the pituitary gland in a little chamber. And, you know, you were kind of learning how to manipulate tissue and, and put little, you know, needles and things. And, you know, ultimately it's just, it's just a dexterity issue over time, but, you know, there's no great way um, to learn basic surgical skills until you're just in the operating room and really operating. And that just, uh, the only thing is it does take, you, you'll get a, 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 an idea of whether you have an affinity to it by going into an animal lab. If you really enjoy the operations and you find that you can do it easily and you enjoy it, then it's usually a good sign that, that surgery will be something you can do well. Very cool. The animal lab is a good thought. Yeah, I got to do perfusions for on prairie voles. So to like fix prairie the moles, those yeah. poor prairie moles. <laughs> I know, I know. Um, <laughs> They lived good lives. I was good to them until then. Yeah, on the um, prairie. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Um, but also, Omer, just going back to like your journey and your story, how did you end up deciding you wanted to come to the U.S.? And how did you find Dr. Langer and end up here at Lenox Hill Hospital? There is no sick. <laughs> That's how I find him. Uh, every good story starts with nose, like I guess, or oh, every, um, you know, um, so, so basically again, um, I, I, I train, I was trained in Israel. I think tra training in Israel has, um, a lot of good things and some downsides also. It's a small country, some, something like the size of Massachusetts in terms of maybe population, 10 million people, maybe a bit more. And so the volume is sometimes, uh, it's not sometimes just not as high, uh, as obviously in a place like in the States. Once you want to do some stuff that are more complex, and again, we're talking about learning curve, we're talking about doing the same procedures over and over again, seeing high volume centers like in Lenox Steel as far as vascular neurosurgery, you, you can't get to that level by doing a case or two a year or watching people to do, do it once, one, one or two cases a year. You have to go to the next level. That's exactly what Lenox is as far as um, an international, um, maybe looming um, center where yeah, you have to get here to get to, to really understand how it's done, to, to look at the, you know, the concept, all the, all the different um, thought behind every case, procedure, you know, complications, how you, you deal with them. So it, if, if I wanted to do this, uh, I had to get to a place like here. Um, fortunately, when I was, I think in my th second or third year, uh, I was just reaching out to, um, there's an Israel neurosurgeon who works in New York, Dr. Erznosek, who was also did, maybe similar, um, tra the trajectory is a bit similar as far as medical school and, and um, we had a different army service, of course, but uh, as far as, as, as the residency and he came here for a fellowship, I just contacted him and he was very kind, um, just you know, offered me to, I was at my monitors at the time. I came over for, for a couple of weeks. Uh, I was watching him work, doing both endovascular neurosurgery and open vascular neurosurgery to me, to, watching him fuse those two in a very high level, it kind of got me converted into believing that's possible because before I wasn't sure it's possible to combine those two. Um, at least, you know, he's very talented, so not everyone can do it, but at least there's a way. Uh, and then obviously he introduced me to Dr. Langer, which I've met also in Tel Aviv later on for a convention. Um, it's a very interesting uh, icon, if you remember. I'm not sure if Dr. Langer remembers, but it wasn't like a huge convention or a conference where everyone spoke about the coolest stuff that they did lately, but it was about specific complications. It was very nice and humbling to see people talk about, okay, this happened to me. It, it, it was a small crowd, uh, but it was very, again, it showed like a different, um, another side. And then um, after, you know, thinking about it, I spoke to Dr. Langer. He was kind enough to offer me a spot here. Um, and I'm here. What a, what a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, it's all getting used in American Erez, coffee. So yeah, Erez is the glue. You know, Erez is a uh, incredibly talented guy. He, he was the one who hooked us up with Netflix, also. So 
you know, this this whole thing wouldn't even be happening without errors because probably brain turns wouldn't have happened without at least this level without Netflix. So Erez is really uh, a wonderful guy and a close friend and he's super talented. And I think he represents the, what's possible. You know, I'll, I'll never be the interventionist that Erez is. And uh, he's got all the skills to be as good or better of a surgeon than me. So uh, I, I look forward to seeing both of you, uh, you know, aspire to great things and, and go crush it uh, in the future. I'm sure you will. Love it. Oh, so cool. Um, it's been awesome having you here, Omer. It's been awesome getting to know you too at Lenox Hill. <laughs> you are a really, really cool guy with a really cool story. Um, it's been a I'm pleasure. Glad Thank you. With us. Yeah, awesome. And yeah, the modeling, I think it's cool just to, to know that like how much you guys care about education and helping the students learn and finding ways to do that. Um, it doesn't go like unnoticed. We really, really appreciate it. Um, and you still do it yourself too. Like it's cool. Um, I'm trying to see if there are any questions in here. Um, let me see. Um, someone was specifically asking how you decided you wanted to do medical school through the army, but did you have to do it through the army? Or um, so there are two, two pathways in Israel. One is just a general one where you do your mandatory service uh, at the age of 18, two or 21, 22 if you're an officer, and then you just decide you do medical school like every other person. Uh, if you want to do it earlier at 18, then yes, you have to go into some sort of relationship with the army. In my case, uh, I was very, um, I, I would say confused, but I, I, you know, if you talk about engineering background, then I thought about physics at the time, was very into it. Uh, and medicine and so forth. There's a program in, in Israel that's um, kind of nurturing um, physicists within the army. I have a couple of friends that were there. It's an amazing uh, opp opportunity to kind of grow into a startup um, kind of mentality within the army. Never mind. So I, I had that kind of um, branching point early on, and I yeah. chose medicine. The first three years of medical school is for me a bit boring in terms of not not boring easy. It was just biology, chemistry, I wasn't like into those stuff. I kind of spoke to my friends, no, I'm going to just, you know, I did a mistake. Tomorrow I'm going to, you know, cancel it. I'm going to go back to the, uh, but after those three years, the clinical years came along. It was much, much more fun, similar to med school in the States. Um, and and at, at that point, I was already invested in like at age 21, 22. At age 25, after completing all that, like I, we spent the summers in the army. So I kind of knew what I'm looking into but, uh, or you know getting to but not 100 percent. and then once you're 25 you just you know put the uniforms on and my unit was an infantry unit kind of uh in israel it's at least known uh for being very rigorous uh, and the training of the soldiers is very rigorous and it's sometimes not not today thank god but like 20 years ago uh as a doctor there it would be a tough place to survive in because um you know you you wouldn't be looked upon it nicely if you would as a soldier i mean walk to the doctor and say look i had a problem you had to expect to be tough and kind of uh take it up the chin and you know people had some horrible injuries so thank god the culture changed and for me it was also kind of a huge shift because i had to do everything with the soldiers so for example i was doing a counter-terrorism course where i was getting hit as part of training you know at the age of 25 26 it's very uh it, it's it's mentally you know, help helps to get you stronger, de definitely pre residency. But it was a very um, different career path where, where I had to do a navigation sometimes in the middle of the night alone with a backpack of 40 kilos. Those kind of stuff are a very, you know, I've studied medicine, then I'm doing this, but I had very good instructors that were making sure I'm like parachuting and all those stuff I'm going to do like in a very um, ordered way. Uh, so th that was a very uh, interesting path. At the end of the day, I had some very hard moments after because I graduated the army once I was 30. So like 25, 26, I joined the army. I was a doctor there. But then at 30, I kind of went on to do my start, my residency. After four years of kind of being in the field, it wasn't easy, but it gave me a lot of, uh, I think, um, points about, um, you know, it made me tougher, basically, I think that that was the main thing. Also, I think as a young doctor, you just graduate med school, you don't know much, right? You spend one year internship, but then all of a sudden within the field, you're the highest, uh, let's say, 
decision making um person as far as medical stuff so again simple stuff for example dislocated shoulder i had a case once we had um we're somewhere not a, a bit further away from israel let's say let's call it that and i had a soldier that dislocated so, soldier it's not that complicated to bring back the shoulder but it is complicated once you're not in your own territory and if you have to give him some morphine that could affect you know his saturation can drop again you're not so what do you do you ask the commander uh to cancel the the, the whole important mm -hmm. mission you don't do it, you wait it out, you try and do it with some sort of painkillers and then do it um, with morphine and saturate, like it, you have to talk on the radio if you want a helicopter, yes, no. All those decisions are very, you know, hard to um, to come to the right decision when you're young, but I think also builds a lot of your character later on because you have to decide, there's no one else to decide uh, and, you know, they're expecting you to, to make those calls. So definitely a very, um, I think yeah. important life experience. I'm, I'm, I'm grateful I had the opportunity to do it. That's what the IDF gives you, basically opportunity to put you in a situation of a bit of stress and, you know, having to decide. But, but that was um, that was it. Wow, very very cool.